Now for today's forum, Politics, Reality TV, and Polite Conversation is sponsored by Taft Law, Hannah News Service, the Ohio Farm Bureau Federation, and the Columbus Foundation, each represented here today by their many associates. Won't you help me welcome them and thank them for their support and also welcome Kelly Grismer, Vice President of Special Projects at the Columbus Foundation, who will introduce today's speakers. Kelly. Thank you, Mo. The Columbus Foundation is proud to support the Metropolitan Club, celebrating diversity, discussion, and debate, and where we have convened public conversations on important topics every week for the past four years. And building on the conversation uh, topic, uh, the, the Columbus Foundation is very proud to bring the big table uh, to Columbus next Tuesday, August 30th. Following the tradition of CMC and the wonderful conversations that you have here, uh, we were excited to try to ignite uh, the power of the Columbus region on one day to talk about the wonderful things that people learn here and the things that they know about in their own lives. Hopefully to not only talk to each other and put aside those phones that we love so much, but also to listen and learn from each other um, in the hope of making the Columbus community even better. And that is our overarching theme for the big table, just making our community better. We are happy to say that there are already 400 hosts, uh, 400 plus hosts, um, who have registered to do a conversation next Tuesday, and there's still time to register. Um, it's very simple, takes about two minutes, and all you have to do is convene eight to 12 of your friends, colleagues, or neighbors um, to talk about how we make our community better. Um, certainly, those of you in this room are on the forefront of doing that, and that's why we've left some fact sheets on your um, chair um, to know more about the big table. Hopefully many of you are participating, um, and if not, we hope that you'll host, um, because we're eager to learn um, from these conversations, and we'll be sharing that information with the community um, not uh, as, as quickly as we can after these conversations happen. So um, we appreciate all of your support and your leadership um, in this conversation, um, conversation uh, topic area that we hope to build on next Tuesday, August 30th. So today's forum is timely. Uh, and we're pleased to welcome some very wise and experienced speakers to share their thoughts on the current tone of conversation in our democracy. So please welcome our as associate professor, professor at Ohio University and a political columnist, Tom Suttis. <laughs> Former member of the House of Representatives and director of state programs at the National Institute for Civil Discourse, Ted Celeste. The former mayor of Cincinnati and American television host, Jerry Springer. And a reporter for the Ohio State House News Bureau, Joe Ingalls. Please welcome all of our speakers, and the podium is yours. Thank you very much, Kelly, and thanks to the CMC for allowing me to be part of this important discussion. Um, as you all know, public radio and TV, uh, civil discourse and discussion on issues is a mainstay of what we do. And, but it doesn't seem that that's really a mainstay of the media anymore. Too often we're seeing uh, this highly polarized, we're seeing the shouting, the, the talk shows that become scream shows, um, and, that, and we're seeing it in a 30 second ad too. We're seeing the nastiness, uh, often untrue uh, accusations that are be, being leveled at people. And so that makes today very important because we've got three people up here who I think are going to be able to provide us with some very interesting insight into what we've seen and, and where we need to go from here. Um, I'm going to start out with Tom Suttis. Uh, Tom has been around for a while and uh, covered a lot of these elections and has some uh, great historical perspective. So I want to ask you first, Tom, everyone keeps saying this election is different. It's unusual. It's uh, groundbreaking in many ways. Is it groundbreaking unusual? Thank you very much. I think it is, but I had... I, what I especially enjoy about it is the number of conspiracy theories that surround the candidacy of <laughs> Mr. Trump, such as um, this is Bill Clinton's revenge for the impeachment or um, somehow he's being financed by, uh, by the Clintons to run. I think it is very important, though, because there's a distinction which I wrote about recently, that's not why it's important, uh, by political scientists, that some elections are called critical elections or realignment elections. 
There's an argument that 1968 was one. You could argue that Richard M. Nixon effectively deployed the Southern strategy of his and his advisors to win the presidency. And also, in Ohio, George C. Wallace won about 12% of the vote, which was more than he won in any other large industrial non-slave state uh, when he ran for president that year. Uh, I think we have reached a point where there's a clash between the politics of identity, which is to say it was unimportant, the politics of, say, gender, the politics of sexuality, the politics of um, race and ethnicity, and the politics of service. So that's to say, what is government going to do for me as opposed to what does government say or stand for? I think there's a shift going on. Now, I think we won't know until after the dust settles in November if this is one of those kinds of elections that redefines what will follow. But I think it depends in large part on Republican turnout. If Republican turnout is depressed, then you can't really say things registered a big change because not that much got signified by the ballot patterns. If there's a huge turnout and if the Senate, for example, turns Democratic and what a year wasn't supposed to necessarily happen, I think you'll see this to have been perceived as one of these so-called realignment or critical elections. Uh, all the more so because obviously people in Columbus are sometimes in a bubble, and this is not to say it's a bad bubble to be in necessarily. But if you are from a Canton, Ohio, or Youngstown, Ohio, or Akron, Ohio, or Springfield, or Cleveland, and so forth, there are large parts of the state where ordinary blue-collar people, good people, tax-paying people, law-abiding people, have not seen the kind of economic progress that others have seen in the state. And I think there's a tremendous quest for people to see some betterment in their lives, and not just rhetoric in their lives about political matters. So let me ask you, uh, Representative Celeste, following up on what Tom just said, um, what about civil discourse in politics? Uh, are we seeing less of it? And uh, what effect does it have? Well, obviously, uh, we are, but uh, expound a little bit on that. Um, well, I, I happen to work uh, with the National Institute for Civil Discourse. And indeed, we've been working uh, very hard with a number of legislators around the country uh, to, to bring civil discourse to the states. Um, we've, we've done... Uh, 17 workshops in 12 states, and through that process have generated uh, about 100 legislators who are committed to uh, civil governance and have formed a national network. In that process, what's happened is the uh, folks that have been uh, funding our, our program, we're a nonprofit, have said in the be about the beginning of the summer that it's turned from a discussion of incivility to where incivility has turned to physical harm, and that is the limit. And you all, as an institute, need to do something. So we've started a national campaign called Revive Civility, Our Democracy Depends on It, and we are reaching out to the public, to the media, uh, to elected officials to say, we all have responsibility for this, and we can do something. So we've. Uh, developed a set of standards, and you can go to our website, uh, nicd.arizona.edu slash standards, and you could commit to standards of conduct as a member of the media, as a member of the public, and as a, uh, uh, an elected official. We've had a number of people um, participating in this, and we've done it around the country. It's encouraging. At the same time, the behavior at the national, at the presidential level, con continues to go downhill. And unfortunately, we're hoping that we can, in, s in a small way, change that. One final thing, we've talked to uh, the folks at the uh, Presidential Debate Commission about standards for that debate in terms of trying to have a real discussion, civil discourse about the issues that are important to be. And that's been greeted with what mood? <laughs> Actually, they, um, they've responded and said, why don't you try to draft something up for us because uh, you've been looking at this. We've done a lot of research on what those, uh, what those ought to be, and we're pretty excited that, uh, that they've talked to us about that process. Great. Mr. Springer, um, your television show, I want to talk about that to start yeah, off with. Yeah, first of all, um, it's on right now. How come everyone's here <laughs> and not watching? <laughs> um, I want to... <laughs> I'm sorry, go ahead. Your TV show uh, yes. has often been excused of exploiting people with emotionally charged situations that have erupted into sometimes violence and have brought out at least the worst in the human condition at times. Um, so 
is it disingenuous in, in some way for, for you to say that you want a, a uh, political climate that is free of uh, a, a good discourse and civility and that sort of thing? Well, though, there are a lot of charges just in that one question. Let me take one, one at a time. Uh, we were not responsible for the Second World War, okay? So <laughs> it, it, here's the deal. Um, the television show uh, is about personal relationships that have turned south. The show is particularly about dysfunctional behavior in personal relationships and people get angry with it. What made it revolutionary, and we didn't know at the time it would be, is that we had never seen that on television before. There is nothing that has ever been on any television show that isn't already in the Bible, in literature, in Shakespeare. There is nothing that you could ever see on our television show that isn't already on, in the social media, P the kids putting on Facebook, you know, who they were with last night, what happened, et cetera. So, if we're being honest about this, what is revolutionary is not human behavior. You know, when people say, let's go back to the good old days when everyone behaved, really? What era do you want to go back to? Um, you know, if, if you're African American, do you really think life was better in the 50s and the 40s and the 30s? Um, so I, I don't buy this notion that things are worse now. I don't even think the political discourse is worse now. Do we not remember 1968, when every month someone was being assassinated, when the cities were burning, when there were demonstrations every place, burning the uh, riots in the cities, uh, burning of draft cards? Um, I admit, you know, the stuff Trump says is crazy. But okay, so you got a loony running for president. But that doesn't mean the whole society is. And uh, so I just don't buy this notion that these are the worst of times. This is the most critical. You know, in my lifetime, we've had a Holocaust. Uh, my parents' lifetime, we've had a, 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 a depression. We've had the war in Vietnam. I mean, we've had all kinds of things going on in the world. What is new is that because of technology and because of the social media, we now get to see everything that is going on in the world every day, and that makes it seem more intense. But I do not buy the notion that people today are poorer behaved. I find, frankly, that we're becoming much more open. I, 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 uh, we're much more open to differences among ourselves. I find it much healthier, frankly. I think if you're gay, it's a much healthier environment than it used to be. If you're a minority, it's a much healthier environment, uh, uh, environment than it used to be. So um, no, I'm, I don't buy this notion, oh my God, everything's going to hell. It's not. There are issues and we have to deal with them. But please don't think that this is the worst or that we're going downhill because frankly, I think we're a lot better off than we were 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40, 50 years ago. But I'm a child of the 70s, and I've got to tell you, um, I, back in the 70s, I don't remember TV shows that had some of the titles of the TV shows that your show has this week. For example, uh, one day this week, the title of the show was, Sorry, Sis, Your Man is Fair Game. And then there's another show to well, that this week. That was a great week. one. That was a good one. <laughs> There's another show this week. Um, <laughs> this, the show is titled "My Transsexual Cousin Wants My Man." Okay. Now, okay. Time out. That—that's what the show is about. The show is about uh, either dysfunctional or out of the ordinary or inappropriate behavior in a personal relationship. If you want to talk about exploitation, I was a news anchor for 10 years. Now that's explo exploitation. And let me tell you what the difference is. Every single night on the news, every local news, every national newscast is about people doing horrible things, from murder to rape to corruption, whatever it is. And whatever the stories are, a news per a journalist will never ask the person, you know, before we run this story, if this casts you in a bad light, if this hurts your family, if this hurts your reputation, we won't do it. No. You want to 
get better ratings, you want to sell your newspapers, and so therefore, the hottest story you can run, be damned how you're hurting the person you're writing about. You do it. And then all of a sudden, if it's a television show, at least with a television show, no one ever, ever gets on our show who doesn't desperately want to be on, who doesn't get to choose the subject. It's totally different. So I just don't want to take lectures from journalists who are telling me that they have set the standard for propriety when the pain that journalism does to people every single day is far greater. Now, the journalists will say in return, well, it's because uh, the people have a right to know. 99, not 99, 80% of the stories that we run on local news, and not local, national news, any news, the public doesn't need to know. The public would like to know. It's interesting. I mean, what did we need to know about O.J. Simpson? Except for the actual people involved, the families involved, there was absolutely no need for society to have to know about it. And yet, for an entire year or two, every single network broadcast was about what's the latest with the O.J. Simpson case. So disingenuousness, whoa. Well, you don't want a lecture from a journalist, but you're going to get a lecture from a professor okay. instead. <laughs> and, and, and then one from uh, an, a former I elected It wouldn't be the first time. And, and I will <laughs> use the famous state house lie, I will be brief. Um, I totally agree with much of what he said to a point. But, and I certainly agree, I think life is better for many people, including people of different sexual diversities, ethnic, racial things. Certainly women alone, given Title IX, for example, which I see on campus, makes a difference in the lives of people. Thanks to governmental action, government can do things to make people's lives better, or at least ameliorate the oppression they face. But part of the responsibility of communicators is not even so much the fact that what you're communicating, because I think people, if they do things that are bad, they're the ones that get their families in trouble. They're the ones that are embarrassed. They're the ones that cause problems for themselves by their conduct, governmentally or politically or personally. But we have a responsibility beyond that, not just to say, well, everyone's talking about Simpson, which is true. And I didn't write about him in 42 years. I don't know how I missed the out. I did. <laughs> but, but the agenda setting theory, which is that it isn't so much that what we talk about is what we tell people what is worth talking about. And by giving people a steady diet of some of this personality stuff we get into, I would argue, why identity politics have gone amok in this country. I mean, it used to be about who's going to fill my pothole, uh, who's going to finish the freeway, who's going to widen the street, who's going to clean up the litter, and now it's become, well, you're different than I am, and I'm a better person than you are because of that. And, and that's because we have this kind of social agenda setting going on. That's the response. It isn't so much the content. It's what, what do we emphasize? And I'm not in any way attacking. You've been very successful. And of course, what the commodity you're delivering is eyeballs of an audience to advertisers. I, I think you're sponsors. I don't know that for sure. You're paying fees to the network. So that's what's going on there, I think. And so I think that I, what do, journalists sometimes take the high road and act like they're the, the children of Mother Teresa, and they aren't. Of course they do, and that's foolish. Mother Teresa wouldn't have children. <laughs> you don't know that yet. <laughs> Next on Springer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, so my, 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 my concern, uh, Jerry, is that, that um, your description of the show fails to uh, appreciate the, the fact that um, you've, you've normalized bad behavior. You've normalized people taking each other in, uh, is not as people but as things and using objects to get at each other. And to me, that, that has lent itself to the creation of the situation where we have Donald Trump today. It is, it is the language that's developed out of that. And what happened, what's happened in that show was the beginning of the creation of role models that are no longer the traditional role models we have about people who, who work with uh, folks on, in, in front of us on TV stations uh, in encouraging people to be working with each other and liking each other and trying to find common solutions as opposed to really getting at each other. Um, I think that's problematic. 
You know, I, I've got to say, as a journalist, um, what drives me is not what gets ratings. I'm in public radio and TV. We don't really get ratings, okay? But what does drive me is a pursuit for the truth and to find out what exactly is happening at the State House? What is happening in Washington, D.C., and how it affects us? It is not something that I ever, I, I never ever consider, uh, is this going to be something that's going to get ratings, or is this going to be something that's going to be highly watched? So I think, honestly, there are journalists out there who are trying uh, to do the right stories oh, sure. and do the right things. We often get drowned out, though. Our message gets drowned out by all of this inflammatory uh, rhetoric that, that really comes about from people who have a very low, um, they have a very low receptiveness to what we're saying. They want something that's more interesting, exciting, fast-paced. And right. I think that's where your show hits that. It kind of sets those, t those tones. It gives an outlet there. Uh. Okay, here's a theory. I, I, I think, look, my show is stupid, all right? <laughs> I've always said that. It's, it's an hour of television. Uh, it, when you're given a whole bunch of options of what to watch, it's one hour and it's stupid. That aside, there is an elitism that is going on here because, for example, when there is comments about shows such as ours, um, ah, trash TV, that's the word you actually see. Imagine calling human beings trash. Now, you take the behavior of the people on the show. Now, our show only deals with dating issues. We don't deal with life-changing issues. Like, we don't do pregnancy tests. We don't do who's the father and all that kind of stuff. We literally do. You know, she's my girlfriend, I found out she's going out with someone else, et cetera, and I get ticked off about it and they pull off a wig. Okay. <laughs> the, people, the people on the show, you call it trash TV. And then I can turn on the television at 11.30 in the evening and see the late night shows. And here come these drop dead gorgeous people that are famous, wealthy, good looking, and they talk about their, the books they've written or whatever, about who they've slept with, what drugs they've been using, and we can't cheer them enough, can't wait till the next album's out, can't wait till the next movie's out. This idea that this dysfunctional behavior is, is a condition of lower income people, it is elitism. The very same behavior of the people on my show is the behavior of people not just in the top levels of politics, but the top levels of show business, the business community. You know what? They didn't luck out in the gene pool of parents, for example, as I did and most of us in this room did. Maybe they weren't born with as good a brain. They weren't born in what we call the good looks, or they're not as wealthy. They don't speak the Queen's English. But they're just as authentic just as real, and when they get ticked off, their language isn't as good. But let me tell you something. If there was an English professor from Harvard who came home one night and found his wife in bed with the next door neighbor, I promise you that English professor from Harvard would not say, forsooth, my dear, what is it that I have found? <laughs> He'd say, get the F out of here, and they pounding him and throwing furniture and screaming because that's in a moment of emotional stress in a personal situation, that's often how human beings react. So before we just start looking down, oh, those trashy people, just look in the mirror. We're all alike. Some of us just dress better. Some of us got better luck in life. But you know what, in a moment of anger or when something bad happens to you, the people on my show, most of them, I really like. When the show's over, they're just like everyone else. Can I have a picture? Jerry, what's a good restaurant to go around here? Will you hold my kid while we take this picture? You know what, they all wanna be happy. But they didn't get my breaks in life, or yours. So, you know, 
let's not pick on them all the time. I don't think we are picking on them. I think, and I think, I think you're confusing two different issues, so to speak. One is, first of all, no one, no one begrudges you your business success. It's a wonderful business success. And, and one could argue, and I will actually would, that you, in effect you're a documentarian. You're doing what amounts to a documentary of a kind of social thing like Oscar, La Vida's, Oscar, um, Oscar Lewis's La Vida about uh, the social work studies. But let me give you an example of what I'm talking about when I'm talking about agenda setting. I took the liberty of looking at one of your tweets the other night, which I enjoyed seeing. And this is accurate, this is a very accurate statement. The RNC convention is just a parody of my show. Even the chanting, this is not how we want a country. Right. Now, I wouldn't disagree with any of that, but the larger point is, we've gotten to the point where we're measuring certain things in terms of things that aren't really, we're measuring liquids with solid measures or something like that. We're using different measurements for the same thing. And that's not the measurement of what should be going on. I mean, why do we, is that the example of what we want to use as a scale of things? It's an imitation of my show. Maybe it's an imitation of my show because in one sense, that kind of show is setting an agenda for collective behavior. Yeah, but I'm saying it shouldn't be. I'm, that, that's the point I'm making. I, when we talk about President of the United States, that's the single most important political job in the world. We want someone with some competence. We want a different standard. Of course there's got to be a different standard. I've never ever thought of the 50,000 people we've had on my show over 26 years because we do 200 shows a year, we finish 25 years, that's 5,000 shows, at least 10 guests a show. That's 50,000 people have been on this show. Not one of them did I ever think should be President of the United States. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm just saying, hey, that's that. But that's not who I want as President. God forbid your kid is, uh, it, it, the example I was giving at the table, it, it, you know, God forbid your kid needs some surgery. You rush into the hospital uh, and you, you, you go in the operating room and the doctor walks in. You want to know that that surgeon at least went to medical school. My argument with the RNC and with Trump is it's a total disrespect of country to think that you can run for president when you've never even been head of a village council, when you've never had to deliver social services to people. How dare you have so little respect for America that it's your first political job? Oh, can I be president? Can I be president? Can I lead the free world? I mean, this has nothing to do with being a Republican or a Democrat, liberal, conservative. Be whatever you want to be. But you've got to love your country more than your political party. We all know that Trump is not qualified to be president of the United States, whatever your views are. I don't care if you hate Hillary Clinton. Trump is, cannot be president of the United States. Can't we see that? It would help them position publicity-wise <laughs> to get there. Reality TV helped position him publicity-wise. You You're exactly right. But I never thought, as I said, anyone on the show, I shouldn't be president, although I'd be a pretty good one. But I shouldn't. <laughs> no, I mean, really, where, where does he get off thinking that he can be president? It's, it's just outrageous. If you're a Republican, vote Republican. But damn it, don't vote for him for president. Vote for the rest of them if you want. Representative Celeste, do you have any thoughts about that? I... See how civil? <laughs> I've bit my tongue a couple times. I know you have. <laughs> Sorry. And um, I, I think, uh, I think the comment that Tom made was, was appropriate, that, that the legitimacy to this campaign got its start from, the, from, this sh from that and other shows like it. And unfortunately, now we're having to live in it in a political realm when we weren't really living in it in the political realm as such until those shows entered into this stage. I'd say also that uh, People can have, as I said before, can make a difference in the process that we relate to what's going on now. Each of us can do it differently, as we have to do here on the stage as a panel and interact with each other, sure. respect each other as part of the process. The same with the folks there. One of the things that we do, uh, Jerry and I'd encourage you to think about this maybe for a future show. They. We, we do a program at the beginning of our workshop that is a, a four-minute video of two people uh, from Iowa. One is the head of the uh, family council 
uh, Christian Council, and the other is the head of the gay rights organization. And the two of them, uh, it's called Unlikely Friendships. And the two of them decided that they would get together and meet and talk about what they had in common and what their differences were. Very powerful discussion. And what's happened is we are now living in our own silos, so it's much more comfortable to be talking to somebody who thinks like us and acts like us and votes like us. We don't spend any time really understanding the other side. Yeah. So we encourage folks to find that person, that unlikely friendship. So when Jerry says, if you're a Republican or Democrat, if there may be some here who don't agree, who've never had coffee, sit down and have coffee, talk about your differences. This is, what, this is how it's going to make a difference. And it's more than just polite conversation. This is about getting to know each other on a personal level. That's a good okay. point. If well, the, the audience, I just want to let you know that in a few minutes, we will move to the audience questions. Um, but I just want to ask you folks a, 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 a final thought here. Um, you know, you're talking about, you know, the, the steady diet of people who look like us and act like us. And, I, you know, I, I immediately think of Facebook and how so many people on Facebook say, oh, I don't want that political friend because they're different than me, or I don't want this person because they do something I don't like. Is the social media aspect perhaps making this even worse? This discourse, this continual, maybe by siloing who your friend is or well, by it, not getting another point of view. It's kind of the other segregation, yeah. The other, the other part of, uh, of social media is that you can, you can do things anonymously. It, you can do it as someone else and, uh, and folks won't know it. So you are a little freer to say the words that you might not say otherwise and do things the otherwise and it just escalates conversation. As I understand it, it's a reason that a number of uh, news outlets have taken comments off their sections just because people do this anonymously. So it, it builds that bad feeling. But then there's a good side to it, too. I mean, you know, the folks, I mean, I'm sure everybody here has gotten in contact with somebody from their high school days or from their college days that you never would have, that you've thought about a lot, that it makes a difference. Maybe you've reconnected. So there's that plus, too. What do you think, uh, Mr. Springer? Do you think that social media has exacerbated the situation of maybe not having a, a proper tone in, in issues like politics and important issues that affect our world. Social media exacerbates everything, good and bad. It enlarges the audience. Uh, thou human behavior has not changed. Thousands of years ago, people would gather in the marketplace or in the town square, and they would talk, gossip about what was going on with their neighbors about the very same issues. Oh, did you hear that the person, let, yeah, what they did, wow. All that social media has done, all that technology has done, is it's enlarged the neighborhood from the person that's physically living next door to you or, or blocked down to the whole planet. And so the conversation is the same, it just involves a lot more people. The Trump phenomenon which earlier has been said at this table that you know television created him or whatever. It enabled him. It didn't create him. That what created him is probably 40 or 50 years ago, let's say 40 years ago, and it didn't just start with Ronald Reagan, but when he said government can't solve problems, government is the problem, we have in this country raised at least two generations of Americans to believe that everything government does is no good, that it's always corrupt, that uh, everyone in politics is horrible, every TV commercial you see is the other guy's a bum, the other guy ought to be in jail. Uh, so you, you grow up in America believing to, that government is horrible, that uh, the president should be disrespected. That's what you teach everyone. So we can't be shocked that, in, in, that at some point someone would run for president who was against the government. 
Now, if you're going to run for president and be against the government, you have to be well known, otherwise you can't be elected president. In our society, there are only two ways you can be well known if you're not in politics, and that is either sports or show business. Well, athletes are too young to run for president, so we should have seen it coming that at some point, we would eventually have someone run for president from the uh, field of show business. Did we know it would be Trump? No. But it would come out from something like that, and by the luck of the draw, it happened to be someone like him. At least when Reagan ran, he had some uh, political philosophy, and he already had been governor of California for eight years, so it was a different situation. But, you know, so Trump was inevitable, but he wasn't created by television. He wasn't created by a social media. Social media enables people to be. Barack Obama never would have been president of the United States if we didn't have cell phones. The Democratic Party didn't get together in 2008, said, hey, let's choose Barack Obama to be our presidential candidate, because all the political wisdom was, oh, we can't have an African American as the candidate, he couldn't get elected. But Barack Obama was able to do it outside of the structure of the party. So with cell phones, he could organize, he could raise money, and all of a sudden, he was raising more money than the party, and he could organize outside of the party. And all of a sudden, it enabled him. So on different ends of the continuum, the same medium that resulted in a Donald Trump also resulted in a Barack Obama. So before we start getting too critical of the media, now you may not like what some of the things Barack Obama does, but there's no one in this room that wouldn't be proud to have had him for a son. The classiest person probably ever to sit in that White House. And so the same media that gave you a Donald Trump also gave you Barack Obama. So it, the media is the vehicle, but it doesn't create the morality of the person. That's a very fair point. So it's the CMC's tradition to take questions, and um, so we would like you to go to the microphone over there if you want to ask a question. Please state your name and ask your question. And we thank you in advance for not making long editorial comments. <laughs> so if you'd like to uh, ask a question, uh, feel free. I think we've got someone right now. Go ahead. Oh, thanks. Uh, Jim Simon, a consultant, former head of communications at Nationwide Insurance. And I began my career in Cincinnati on city council campaigns when you were there, Jerry. Um, let's assume, for the sake of argument, that Hillary gets elected and that she's trying to govern from the center. Living in the age of gotcha, which we've kind of been addressing, uh, how successful do you think she might be in, in trying to bring that about given the media's focus and the polarization we live under. Okay, uh, I can't totally uh, separate myself from my partisanship. So, uh, so take that into account with what I say. I think one of her skills, and I think if you talk to Republican senators while she was in the Senate, and even when she was Secretary of State, well, let's take the year she was in the Senate. Republican senators in private will tell you that she was great to work with, she could talk across the aisle. In fact, one of the reasons the Bernie Sanders people are upset with Hillary is that she is able to talk across the aisle. So I am saying, if that is the issue, I think she's better positioned than most other politicians to be able to do that, because she is a politician herself. So she's from the, the good old days when politicians could talk to each other across the aisle. Let me add to that, though. It may have nothing to do with who the president is, because unfortunately, we have created this structural division in our uh, government. And what I mean by that is, as you know, every 10 years, according to the Constitution, you have the census, and then the state legislatures uh, draw the congressional line. So even though in America more people vote Democrat than Republican, we still get an overwhelmingly Republican Congress because the way they've, most of the legislatures are Republican. The Republican Party was very smart. Starting with Goldwater, they were reacting to the liberalization of American government, first with FDR and now with the Great Society, that all of a sudden Goldwater thought the only way to fight back was at the local level, state governments, et cetera. And so the Republicans have been very good in winning local state legislative seats 
governor's races, et cetera. Once they got control of their state houses, they got to draw the lines. So today, even though, as I said, most people vote Democrat, you still get an overwhelmingly Republican Congress. So, and now, only th according to Cook, uh, the Cook political analysis, of the 435 congressional districts in America, only 37 of the 435 are seriously contested. So basically, 90% of our Congress never has to worry about winning a general election. The only election they have to worry about is winning their party's primary. Because if they win their party's primary, they're a shoe in to get elected. So that means the more extreme elements of both parties have input. And that's why if you're a Republican congressman, you can't even have your picture taken with President Obama because that will be used in a commercial by your Republican opponent in the Republican primary. That is the reason you don't get congressmen talking with each other anymore. They're afraid to make a deal. Rubio in Florida got in trouble. I'm glad he did, but Rubio in Florida got in trouble because remember the Gang of Eight that was gonna have the immigration reform? He, he literally paid the price within the Republican presidential primaries because they got the pictures of him talking with Democrats. McCain gets in trouble for doing that. So that's what I think the problem, I think Hillary will be in a better position than anyone else, but I'm not here to tell you that come January 20th, all of a sudden the parties are gonna start talking to each other. Structurally, we've got to change how these districts are drawn. Yeah, and I know, Tom Suttis, you've talked a lot about redistricting in some of your columns and, and the effect that that's had, uh, a chilling effect sometimes on politics, right? Um, what I can tell you real quickly is that, uh, unusually for me, is that uh, we have 16 congressional seats in the state, uh, U.S. Congress seats. President Obama carried the state twice uh, by more than 50 percent, just a little bit over 50 percent. And yet of our 16 Congress people, four are Democrats and 12 are Republicans. And if you look at the numbers, you can actually add up all the Democratic votes and Republican votes in the two, um, and all, all 16 districts combined, you'll find out that Democrats, Republicans should be much, should be much closer to 8-8 eight, eight, as opposed to 4 and 12. And that happened because uh, our General Assembly, and this is documented pretty much, was uh, trying to please the specifications sent by Speaker Boehner to the State House, and uh, the Senate and the House and the, the Governor uh, signed off on a plan that, uh, that did that. Um, when you have a congressional district that reaches from Champaign County, Mr. Jordan's, to include the city of Oberlin, ironically enough, and Lorraine County, I think it's something like 150 miles in that district or something like that between the two seats. You see these are drawn not because of geographic considerations, but because of political considerations. And Mr. Celeste, you're, you know, you're shaking your head. Yeah, I was just going to say that uh, w one of the reasons that uh, we do the program that we do uh, with state legislators is that yeah. Over 50% of the people who end up in Congress come from state houses. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to work with people before they get there, before the clause of that partisanship get there and get them working together. And interestingly enough, in the four years we've been doing this, in the beginning, there were people from both parties who wouldn't come because their caucus chair said, don't show up. We don't want you mixing it up with the other side, just as you pointed out. But that's changing. And the encouraging thing is there's leadership leadership, speakers and presidents of the Senate, who now believe that the, that the leadership has to lead on this issue. And so they're, they're not threatened by the fact that their, their caucuses may be getting together. And so that's an encouraging sign. And so, I, you know, maybe it's not gonna be next year, but in a few years, I think uh, th that there will be uh, better behavior, more cooperation. Do you have any more questions or has that, that answered it? Okay, I see we have another question here. Hi, yes, uh, Andy Campbell, thanks for being here, everybody. You know, when you think of shows that have set the tone for uh, political conversation, I think of Rush Limbaugh as opposed to some of the reality TV things, but that's a, another topic. Um, I'm thinking of tribalism and the silos that you mentioned, Republican, Democrat, Michigan, Ohio State. What do we have to do to get everybody to understand we're ultimately on the same team and we benefit so much more? I don't want to say that we identify a common enemy, but how can we bring that spirit of, you know, we're all in this together back? Um, a, a quick uh, suggestion, when I, when, again, from what we do during our workshops, 
we have a thing called uh, a political journey, and it actually comes from something that we started uh, back at First Community Church called Faith in American Politics, where we put together a, uh, a, a group uh, to talk about how to better understand each other. And what we do in this journey is ask people to think about an event in their life that had the most profound impact on who they are today who they are, their values, and then share it. And basically it's a process of sharing and posting and people reading and, and hearing from each other. And what happens is those barriers that you automatically assume, well, he's a Republican because he's going to think this, or he's a Democrat, he's going to think this. You start getting people to think on the common ground. What are our commonalities? What? Gee, yeah, we are all here for the betterment of Idaho or Ohio or whatever. And you, you, you can come to a conclusion. So everybody has their story. And it's, it's, a, it's a profound way to share with others and get to the point that I think you're talking about that doesn't happen ordinarily. So it really requires people uh, being willing to share and be in a safe place where they feel comfortable sharing. One of the things, um, it appears that Donald Trump is, is actually bringing new voters into the process, uh, at least he'd tell us that, and it does seem like some of these people, when you go to the Trump rallies, they tell you they haven't voted for a long time, or ever. And so knowing this, the voters seem to be drawn to the maybe the celebrity of him or something. I, I'm not sure what's so different about him that they see than, than others before. Um, but the, the attitude of voters seems to have changed, or maybe it hasn't changed. Maybe he's tapping into something there. Let me ask you folks, what do you think is happening with the Trump phenomenon here? I'd, I'd be interested to know how many of those new voters uh, are Jerry Springer show watchers. <laughs> oh, well, I have the number right here. Uh, um, actually, uh, because I, I do a warm up before every show, and we have, you know, we do five shows a week, uh, three on Mondays, two on Tuesdays. We tape them, and there's a new audience for each show, 250 people. So I do a warm up. I go out, I tell some jokes, and then, but I do. They know I'm political, so then I do ask that. And interestingly, our audience, certainly the people that come to this show, um, are not Trump at all, but. You know, also a lot of our audience is, you know, we, we are racially diverse. Um, you know, I, I would argue in a sense when you look out at the audience, it really is a cross-section of America. They're all young, but it's a cross-section of America. These are college kids. And, uh, and so, no, they, you, they're not, in other words, <laughs> because they're not allowed to the show if they are. Yeah. No. <laughs> Tom no, Suttis, I'm I, I, are the voter attitudes changing? I mean, you, you, you look at a lot of these kind of I, things. Uh, I don't uh, really think so. I think that a great deal of uh, what people say is what they want you to hear and um, about whether they've never voted before or voting for the first time and so forth. What I do think is that, um, is that uh, Mr. Trump has helped people that have a really polarized view of society think they have finally someone who is expressing what they think about things. And... Um, I think it's tough for a lot of people that have had power in our society who tend to be, and I'm not being PC, it's just a fact, ladies and gentlemen, uh, older white males to have to deal with the fact that we live in a society that I'm very grateful for the fact is changing rapidly uh, in terms of more uh, empowerment of more kinds of people. That's a difficult thing to do when you've won a place for several hundred years, and I think that's part of what's going on with the Trump phenomenon. I honestly believe that. Okay. Yeah, I, totally agree with you. I see we have another question out here. I'll let you ask your question. I'm Melissa Weber, and Mr. Springer, I want you to know the first time I met you, you were running for governor, and I was at Bowling Green State University, and I was on your campaign, so that's not why you lost. You're... No, his brother beat me. And I voted for him, so. too, so that's... Yeah. So I, I want to put a couple of comments that you all made together and then ask you a question. So, sure. Mr. Celeste, you commented that uh, his show helped to normalize bad behavior. I don't have anything for you, Tom, but um, my, my question is, have you ever thought about following up with any of those 5,000 people who have been on, or 50,000 people who have been on your show? Or have you thought about showing us 
how normal they are when the real cameras go off. So can, can we see their humanity and not their fighting? Can, can you bring in a, some civil discourse people and teach them how to talk to one another? Because I don't think people want to live with drama every day. And yet, in my own life, I certainly see a lot of it. And it would be really nice if maybe you could teach a lesson once in a while. Well, the closest I get to it, and uh, the closest I get to it is I, because the audience is much larger, obviously, at home than the 250 people sitting there, is every show uh, I do a two-minute commentary at the end where I really do give my point of view. And it's, you know, the only thing that's possibly could get me into heaven is my final thought. Uh, and I do it for that reason, because when Judgment Day comes, I want to be able to say, God, but remember my final thought, you know. Uh, so th that's the only time I give that. I'm, we make it very clear to people coming on the show uh, that you do not come on our show to get help. And, and, and I, I'm serious about that. This is a television show. You want to come on the show and get something off your chest, fine. But any problem that can be solved in a one-hour television show is, by definition, not a very serious problem. I'm not trained. I'm not going to, because of one television show, get in someone's life, give my little bit, and then move on. Move on. So uh, if I have any complaint about people that do these talk shows, is that they put on the air as if they are really getting involved in this person's life, going to change the person's life. That's ridiculous. This is television. We're not doctors. We're, uh, you know, we're not trained to do that. I'm a television personality. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a professional counselor. I'm trained to be a lawyer. I don't know how to do this. So I say, now, we give them names of counselors and things like that to go and seek help. But you don't come on the show to get help with something like that. And let's be honest, if you really do watch the show, it's about who's dating whom. And you know, we've all been 18 to 30, and you're dating someone, and it doesn't go right, and you get ticked off, and tomorrow you're dating someone else. So in the list of all the issues that concern us in the world, I can't really say that this is something I can't sleep over, because we, you know, we don't take those serious issues. It's a television show, and one it's show one isn't going to change the world. Did you do just one special on civil discourse? <laughs> You've just seen it. <laughs> OK, well, thank you very much. We appreciate it. Yeah. And I'll turn the uh, podium back over to Mo now. Thank you. Let's thank Jerry Springer, Top Setters, Ted Celeste, and Joe Ingalls for this great conversation today. We hope you uh, enjoyed today's forum. Uh, we encourage you to continue the conversation here over coffee and cookies. Uh, just know that all of our forums are available for rebroadcast on Columbus Television through WOSU PBS affiliates throughout the state and our YouTube channel via the CMC website. Uh, thanks again to our sponsors, Hannah News Service, Ohio Farm Bureau Federation, the Columbus Foundation, and Taft Law. Uh, Jerry, I've got to tell you that you are the reason why I was late to every freshman honors English class. <laughs> uh, I would leave, I would leave, during the long break at the 30 minute mark, I'd leave class, I'd sprint across campus, so I'm always five minutes late, but it was worth it. <laughs> you too can be chairman of the Metropolitan Club after watching Jerry Springer. There you go. Thank you very much, folks. We'll see you next week. That That's true. That's absolutely true. That is absolutely true.